Okay, how's it going, y'all? So uh, we're about to read some Lenin. This is uh, the Socialist Party and the Non-Party Revolutionism. And uh, so this is going to be uh, the first section. This was written in 1905. It has two sections to it. I think we could get in. They're, they seem a little long, but you know, I don't, I don't know. I think you know they're divided into two, so it, it should be easy to do. So we're going to read the first part here. The revolutionary moment in Russia, which is rapidly spreading to ever new sections of the population, is giving rise to a number of non-party organizations. The longer the urge for association has been suppressed and persecuted, the more forcibly it asserts itself. All sorts of organizations, frequently loose in form, and most original in character, are constantly springing up. They have no hard and fast boundaries, as have organizations in Europe. Trade unions assume a political character. The political struggle blends with the economic struggle, as, for instance, in the form of strikes, and this gives rise to temporary or more or less permanent organizations of a blended type. What is the significance of this phenomenon, and what should be the attitude of social democrats towards it? Strict adherence to the party principle is the co 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 corollary, corollary, I think that's the word there, co corollary, and the result of a highly developed class struggle, and vice versa. The interests of the open and widespread class struggle demand the development of the strict party principle. That is why the party of the class-conscious proletariat, the Social Democratic Party, has always quite rightly combated the non-party idea, and has worked steadily to establish a closely-knit Socialist Workers' Party consistent in its principles. The more thoroughly the development of capitalism splits up the entire people into classes, accentuating the contradictions among them, the greater is the success of this work among the masses. It is quite natural that the present revolution in Russia should have given rise, and should continue to give rise, to so many non-party organizations. This is a democratic revolution, i.e., one which is bourgeois as regards its social and economic content. This revolution is overthrowing the autocratic, semi-feudal system, extricating the bourgeois system from it, and thereby putting into effect the demands of all the classes of bourgeois society. In this sense, being a revolution of the whole people. This, of course, does not mean that a revolution is not a class revolution. Certainly not. But it is directed against classes and castes, which have become, which, which have become or are becoming obsolete from the point of view of bourgeois society, which are alien to that society and hinder its development. And since the entire economic life of the country has already become bourgeois in all its main features, since the overwhelming majority of the population is in fact already living in bourgeois conditions of existence, the anti-revolutionary elements are naturally extremely few in number, constitu constituting truly a mere handful as compared with the people. Hence the, class of nature, hence the class nature of the bourgeois revolution inevitably reveals itself as the popular at first glance, non-class nature of the struggle of all classes of a bourgeois society against autocracy and feudalism. The epoch of the bourgeois revolution in Russia, no less than in other countries, is distinguished by a relatively undeveloped state of the class contradictions peculiar to capitalist society. True, in Russia, capitalism, in Russia, capitalism is more highly developed at the present time than it was in Germany in 1848. To say nothing of France in 1789. But there is no doubt about the fact that in Russia, purely capitalist antagonisms are very much overshadowed by the antagonisms between culture and Asiatic barbarism, Europeanism and Tartarism, capitalism and feudalism. In other words, the demands that are being put first today are those the satisfaction of which will develop capitalism, cleanse it of the slag of feudalism, and improve the conditions of life and struggle both for the proletariat and for the bourgeoisie. Indeed, if we examine the demands, instructions, and doliances, which are now being drawn up in infinite numbers in every factory, office, regiment, police unit, parish, educational institution, etc., etc., all over Russia, we shall easily see that the overwhelming majority of them contain purely cultural demands, if we may call them so. What I mean is that, actually, they are not specifically, specifically class demands. But demands for elementary rights, demands which will not destroy capitalism, but, on the contrary, 
Bring it within the framework of Europeanism and free it of barbarism, savagery, corruption, and other Russian survivals of serfdom. In essence, even the most proletarian demands are limited, in most cases, to reforms of the sort that are fully realizable within the framework of capitalism. What the Russian proletariat is demanding now, and immediately, is not something that will undermine capitalism, but something that will cleanse it, something that will accelerate and intensify its development. Naturally, as a result of the special position, which the proletariat occupies in capitalist society, and striving of the workers towards socialism, and their alliance with the Socialist Party, assert themselves with elemental force at the very earliest stages of the movement. But purely socialist demands are still a matter of the future. The immediate demands of the day are the democratic demands of the workers in the political sphere, and economic demands within the framework of capitalism in the economic sphere. Even the proletariat is making the revolution, as it were, within the limits of the minimum program and not of the maximum program. As for the peasantry, the vast and numerically overwhelming mass of the population, this goes without saying its maximum, this goes without saying, its maximum program, its ultimate aims, do not go beyond the bounds of capitalism, which would grow more extensively and luxuriantly if all the land were transferred to the whole of the peasantry and the whole of the people. Today, the, the peasant revolution is a bourgeois revolution. However much these words may jar on the sentimental ears of the sentiment, sentimental knights of our petty bourgeois socialism. The character of the revolution now in progress, as outlined above, quite naturally gives rise to non-party organizations. The whole movement, therefore, on the surface, inevitably acquires a non-party stamp, a non-party appearance, but only on the surface, of course. The urge for a human, civilized life, the urge to organize in defense of human dignity, for one's rights as man and citizen, takes hold of everyone, unites all classes, vastly outgrows all party bounds, and shakes up people who are yet, who as yet are very, very far from being able to rise to party allegiance. The vital need of immediate elementary essential rights and reforms puts off, as it were, all thought and consideration of anything further. Preoccupation with the struggle and progress, a preoccupation that is quite necessary and legitimate, for without it, success in the struggle would be impossible causes people to idealize these immediate elementary aims, to depict them in rosy colors, and sometimes even to clothe them in fantastic garb. Simple democracy, ordinary bourgeois democracy, is taken as socialism and registered as such. Everything seems to be non-party. Everything seems to fuse into a single movement for liberation. Actually, a movement liberating the whole of bourgeois society. Everything acquires a faint and very faint tint of socialism, owing above all to the leading party played by the socialist proletariat in the democratic struggle. In these circumstances, the idea of non-partisanship non-partis- cannot but gain certain temporary successes. The slogan of non-partisanship non-partis- cannot but become a fashionable slogan, for fashion drags helplessly at the tail of life, and it is the non-party organization that appears to be the most common phenomena on the surface of political life. Non-party democracy non-party democratism, non-party strikeism, non-party revolutionism. The question now arises, what should be the attitude of the adherents and representatives of the various classes towards this fact of non-party organization, towards this idea of non-partisanship? Should, that is, not in the subjective sense, but objectively, i.e., not in the sense of what view to take of it, but in the sense of what attitude is inevitably taking shape under the influence of the respective interests and viewpoints of the various classes. Okay, yeah, so that's uh, the Socialist Party and non-party revolutionism. This is, uh, let's see, yeah, this was uh, released in 1905. This is Lenin. So yeah, well, next time when we come in, we'll read part two. And, you know, thank you all for tuning in. Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, TikTok, Tumblr, Medium, all of these are Marxist. You can follow me there. You have a great day. Dodada goi.